on this episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab. Compliments and criticism, the psychology of shaming on this episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab. Welcome to Therapy Bites Art Lab, where Dr. Heath and his special guests share real life stories of helping and healing. Fresh from the actual therapy couch, while taking a bite out of common counseling missteps and misconceptions. And now, here's Heath and the T-Ball team. On today's episode, we would like to talk to the parents of kids that may need to be protected for some things that are currently out on social media. We also want to talk to those teens. This is going to be a clean episode. We'd like to keep all of our episodes clean. If it has some kind of borderline gray area Uh, questionable stuff that young people may not hear we always put an e up for explicit but this is not one of those episodes because we really want to speak to teens today as well as those that may be struggling with their own self-concept and to that end uh, we have a, a a name that we want folks to consider and then change their minds about how they view themselves but we call these uh pixel pattern victims because there's there's lots of people out there that they will see these pixels in a pattern on a page and come to think that those words those pixels in a pattern on a page define them as a human being and we want to challenge that today and then finally uh, our audience today would be who we call and we say this to be offensive to these people this is intended Uh, Keyboard cowards. Uh, We're speaking to the keyboard cowards that would try to say things to people to belittle them or to humiliate them or to cause them to view themselves in a less than favorable light as less than a human being. And we at Therapy Bites Art Lab think that uh, social media in many ways is just a new stage for bullying people. And those who would not get away with it on a playground, well, their playground has become social media. But there is hope because, as we just indicated, those words are simply pixels in a pattern on a page. And today we're tackling uh, the psychology of shaming. Uh, Compliments and criticism, how do you handle each? And we have in our studio today, as always, our uh, Art Lab regulars, uh, bookworm Sarah, there she is, and our gamer girl Heather hey. in her brand new Therapy Bites uh, fall t-shirt, which you can get on our Therapy Bites Shopify store, <laughs> and squirrel girl uh, Debbie, uh, she's a little bit off, she's kind of squirrely, uh, <laughs> uh, best friends, and she has a picture of a squirrel for life, and uh, that's fairly disturbing. But, uh, <laughs> each their own. Well, I'd like to start out, guys, today talking about how you guys uh, pass out compliments and criticism. Because here's what I've noticed: that there seems to be a continuum. There are some folks that they just compliment, compliment, compliment to where it just becomes noise. And as a person, if 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 you compliment me, I'm very happy with that. But if it's just every single time then i come to think of that as more about you and less about being genuine with complimenting me Uh, but i think the same thing about criticism if you criticize me i will look to see if i need to improve Uh, i don't actually take those things personally i just look to see if they're evidence-based if you tell me that hey you need to brush your teeth I'll find a mirror and look at my teeth and see if there's something stuck in between them, and I'll gladly go brush my teeth. I don't personally think that that means I'm less of a person, like many people on the uh, Internet and in social media might. I I really don't. I I just see it as pixels in a pattern on a page. If you're in front of me in the same location, I just view it as Marcus Aurelius recommended that we view it as air set in motion, or as I would revise that, sound waves riding on air set in motion and the question is how could that be dangerous or harmful to me it's just air you're expelling from your lungs and you're you know turning that air through you know some vocal controls into words and no i i I don't think that uh, that words can hurt us i'm you know myself uh not really offended by words don't take words seriously there's some words i don't prefer to hear 
Uh, but that's okay. I, I think that we should be able to speak words and uh, the control should be more on the person hearing than the person speaking. And I, I, I hear words in a very definite way. How do you guys hear criticism? How do you hear compliments? Well, if, if I hear criticism, I tend to look at it. And first thing I ask myself is, you know, is there something here that I need to learn from this? Is, is there accuracy here? I, I look and kind of examine myself. And then once I've done that, I decide whether I'm going to change something, if I need to change something or, or not. And I don't dwell on it. You know, I just take it as it comes. Is that in all cases or are there some cases where if it's a particularly fine edge criticism, you struggle with it? Yes. <laughs> what, would the, what would that be? In, in what areas do you guys really struggle with criticism? Because some criticism you may be fairly immune to. You know, I hate your hairstyle or, yeah. you know, that's an ugly squirrel shirt. Uh, but what are some what are some areas <laughs> where you are vulnerable? And by the way, there's a whole social meme thing going about based on what I don't think is some very good research about vulnerability. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's get this clear. Vulnerability means something that is a threat to you. I think I think it a lot has to do with who is giving the criticism, mm -hmm. who the criticism is coming from. Okay. So if it's somebody, somebody real close to me, somebody that um, that I really look up to or or really value their opinion, if that makes sense, then it wouldn't be as as heavy or deep of an effect if it's just someone on social media. Correct. Because so, you don't know them. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, might it surprise you that that's just the opposite of what many people, uh, uh, how people respond on social media? Because mm -hmm. very, very few people, if any, unless it's family members and friends on social media, maybe the same school or the same church or the same neighborhood, uh, you're going to know. But have, have you guys seen the impact of people's criticisms? And there are kids that will go jump off a bridge yes. if someone criticizes them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, why are you, why are you different? How are you different? Uh, or, or are you different? Do you really take serious or could you take serious if somebody on social media that you have some vague familiarity with is very highly critical of you? I don't think necessarily anymore. I will say that at a time in my life, yes. And there were times where... Um, I was going through some difficult things where anybody's opinion, whether I knew them or not, really mattered to me. But after working on practicing, like the, like we talk about, the accurate, realistic thinking and taking things into consideration and really going through therapy and working on things and really thinking about, well, how important are, like you said, those pixels on a page, those patterns, how really important are those to what I need to really do I really need to take those as, for lack of a better term, gospel and really like make that a pattern of life and that I need to take those and take them to heart and everything? The longer I think about it and the longer I, you know, kind of processed it and went through things, no, like they're not, they're just what they are. They're patterns on a page. They're another person's opinion. They don't necessarily impact how I view myself. But that's different, I mean, now yes. than then. What was it then that was so powerful to you that you would take those comments seriously and incorporate them into your thinking about yourself? I think it was just that I had very little confidence and very. I was looking for approval. I okay. was looking for um, someone to like me. For me, but if they didn't, then there was something wrong with me. Okay, I was the problem. And I don't put I don't want to put words in your mouth. Let me let me know if I hit the target or not. Are you saying that uh, perhaps there were already some pre-existing thoughts in your mind about who you were as a person, mm -hmm. and those thoughts that you had about yourself as a person were unfavorable? Yes. By the way, we call them in the art lab stuck points. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also known in cognitive psychology as what? Cognitive distortions, distortions. distorted mm -hmm. ways of thinking. We call them automatic negative thoughts, ants or negative automatic thoughts. And we have a whole host of critters 
that we've created to help explain those things, little ants and, and flying gnats. Uh, but what you're saying, Heather, is that you had some stuck points, some thoughts about yourself, which were along the lines of what? I, I'm not valuable. I'm worthless. Uh, yeah. I'm a waste of space. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, burdened to others. Say that last. I'm sorry. I'm a burden to oh, others. Oh, I'm a burden to others. Mm-hmm. I, I would, others would be better off if I didn't exist. Mm-hmm. Thoughts like that. Yep. And by the way, do you guys know the percentage of the population that thinks such things? I'm going to give it a, what I think is a low number. I think the number, it would be somewhere around 98% mm. of the population, if they're being honest, will have mm-hmm. fleeting thoughts such as, I'm not valuable, I don't mm-hmm. count, I don't matter, I don't measure up. Uh, these people, those people, my family, my company, my schoolmates, whoever, my ch- choir group would be better off if I didn't exist. I think those are very typical thoughts, but I like to remind people that the brain manufactures thoughts like blizzards manufacture snowflakes. The presence of a thought means what? Nothing. We as humans have to geotag or add meaning to a thought for it to have any. Just out there birthed out of the ether on its own, I'm going to strip naked, paint my body purple, run down the interstate, has no meaning, has no value. I have to decide if that particular thought has value. Lucky for you guys, not only do I not think that particular (laughs) thought has value, I don't have any purple paint today. You're safe. Yeah. I'm going to call all the hardware stores and tell them to get rid of all the Don't sell this guy any purple paint. paint. He's (laughs) having dangerous thoughts about stripping naked, painting his body purple. Well, and tell me if I'm wrong, Dr. Um, Heath, but um, is it too that when you're not thinking accurately and you're kind of absorbed in those thoughts, instead of taking the compliments, people are kind of looking more at the criticism and they're taking those more for as as supporting evidence for their thoughts what an excellent point and the analogy or actually metaphor i like to use is your brain more or less becomes stickier your neurons become stickier for the things you're looking for and they become teflon to the things you're not looking for and the thoughts that are favorable to you uh your brain uh, becomes Teflon to those, and they just slide off. They, they just gain no traction because you're not looking for those. Mm-hmm. And when I say you're not looking for those, what I really mean is you're not thinking about those. And we have one of our critters, the underthinking ant. You'll know him <laughs> yes. by his big, long telescope, which mm-hmm. is pointed at the ground. He is zeroed in on the ground, ignoring important aspects of the situation. And that is that a lot of these compliments may be very genuine and very accurate. Uh, I will say to patients when they say, I just sometimes think I'm worthless, I'll say, I don't know, maybe you are. We just met. (laughs) Quite shocking. But where's your evidence? I mean, could we take you to court and convict you? Of being worthless. A judge of one, a jury of 12, guilty of being worthless. And we're sending you to, I don't know, worthless prison or something. (laughs) Uh, But if we apply that to what we're hearing in social media often, and in my social media debates, I get a lot of that. It's really quite alarming. I'll have people hurl some insults, and they'll hurl a lot of vitriol and a lot of venom and a lot of despicable things. I I may disagree with you, but I believe in being courteous. Now, I can be very uh, edged. I can put a fine edge on things, but I do try to be courteous. I do use the word keyboard cowards because I'll ask these people, hey, meet me for a cup of coffee. I'll buy the coffee. I'll buy the donut. If you're that convinced uh, that you've got the upper hand in your argument, uh, and if you want to be a bully, then do that to me face-to-face. Don't cower behind a keyboard. Uh, I will guarantee you that if that you would not get away with this on the playground because you're just some scrawny kid, uh, scrawny human being uh, that gets off on putting other people down. 
And I think that's despicable. But see, that's me, and I don't take it seriously. I, I, I will sit and laugh at this stuff. I have people tell me things. I just think it is freaking hilarious. But there are kids that do take it very seriously. Mm-hmm. And to Heather's point, those comments will stick to their brains like flypaper. Mm-hmm. And that is very, very dangerous. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they've not been taught how to put those thoughts into perspective it mm-hmm. is just a thought it doesn't have meaning therefore you don't have to allow it to to have traction uh what, what about you sarah debbie how do you deal with some of the more difficult criticisms that you run into that's a hard one and i i will say this is an area that i still do have some difficulty in. it's gotten a lot better um but really you know after the initial kind of inaccurate thoughts that I'll have to begin with like well what if they're right you know what if this is you know something wrong with me what if they see something I don't I try to take a step back and and really focus on well wait a minute what's the truth of the situation you know and even if I need to you know there's wisdom in many counselors if I need to go talk to somebody and be like hey is this really an issue with me and do I need to do something about it you know and most of the time, if it's just something off social media, they're like, well, no, that's just ridiculousness. But, you know, and other times it's like, well, you know, I think you could you could work on this a little bit, you know. And, and I love that because I approach it the same way. I will approach criticism with curiosity. Mm-hmm. I will approach it like eating chicken. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to swallow the whole bird. I will pick out the bones mm-hmm. and I will eat just the meat. And I think that's also the difference in what's on social media, all these criticisms, and we'll get to the shaming in a minute. We have a a few myth perceptions, M-Y-T-H, myth perceptions to to dissolve and dissipate with the whole shaming thing there. Uh, You'll see that coming up. But I, I would recommend viewing it with curiosity. I view it as curiosity and ask myself, well, does this person have a point? And if they have a point, it doesn't matter how how angry, how disrespectful. If you're angry, there's nothing wrong with being angry. Mm-hmm. Uh, anger is a normal human emotion, but I think we can be respectful and be angry. Um, but I, I try to approach it with curiosity and see if there's a way I can improve myself. And there's always, always, always room in my life for self-improvement and so no matter what the person's intent was I don't try to assume their intent I will simply try to pluck out the value from what they're saying and if that helps me well then thank you very much you 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 meant it for me to eat you meant it to me for evil uh, but I'm going to take it for good (laughs) all right okay Uh, parents and teens keep listening up we have more coming ahead and uh, think about how you present criticism to people. Uh, when I present criticism to people, uh, I can be very pointed, but if I don't care about you, I'll be silent. Also, if you're not going to take the words that I say and do something with them, I'll save my breath. Uh, my dad used to say, uh, uh, never try putting lipstick on a pig. It just frustrates you and annoys the pig. Well, <laughs> If you're going to be pig-headed about it and you're not going to take see value in it, then why I'm just going to save my breath for someone that, that might take value in it. How, how do you guys present criticism to people, or do you? This podcast is HIPAA compliant. No identifying patient information will be disclosed without permission from patients or guardians. All personal stories will be de-identified in order to comply with HIPAA, the NASW Code of Ethics, and the ethical principles of psychologists and code of conduct. Doc Heath back with some stories from the deep dark recesses beneath the therapy couch. I have lots of patients that come to me for relationship therapy and one of the things that they tend to catastrophize is having disagreements and they'll call it fighting. We fight all the time. And I like to challenge them and ask if they could sell tickets to Madison Square Garden of such a fight. I mean, imagine what would happen. The, this spouse will come out of their corner weighing in at this amount. This spouse will come out of this corner weighing in at this amount. And they will come to the center of the ring and they would pull their dukes back. These are dukes, we call these dukes in the South. And they would say what? They would do what? They would have an uncomfortable exchange of various non-preferred words, phrases, and sentences. And then there'd be a riot. 
and because all the audience would want all their freaking money back. You know why? Because that's not a fight. You can biggie size your relationship by simply changing your programming and seeing those as not fights, because that's a pretty pitiful fight, but seeing that as simply an uncomfortable exchange of words, phrases, and sentences. In our world, that's called decatastrophizing. Decatastrophizing that next uncomfortable encounter could go a long way at biggie sizing your relationship. You're listening to Therapy Bites Art Lab. Bite-sized therapy for your brain with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball Team. The best advice on the net. No copay required. Imagine waking up in the middle of the night, seeing the face that you married for so many years, but you don't recognize them. You have no idea who this person is. Our secret psych disorder of the day is prosopagnosia. The brain loves faces and it actually encodes facial configurations, but there is a diagnosis resulting from a syndrome of an inability of the fusiform facial area to recognize faces, but that's very rare. What we see mostly in therapy is not failure to recognize a face, but failure to recognize and remember who someone is to you. When you start talking to your spouse and you're really irritated, upset, put out, uh, downtrodden because of things going on with your spouse, one of the best things you can do is to remember who they are to you. Create a structure in your brain of what it means to you to have them in your life. How did you meet them? What are all the wonderful attributes that they have? We should keep these pieces of knowledge, these pieces of engineering, these pieces of neuronal encoding before us, and that will go a long way when we're having conflict, when we're hearing criticism. To remind ourselves who this person is to us can go a long way toward making it a healthier relationship. Here's Heath and the T-Ball team. I think that's something I'm getting better with. Um, I used to not. It was because it's a conflict. It can be. It doesn't have to be, but it can be a conflict, and I tend to avoid conflict. Criticism is always a conflict in this way. Criticism conflicts with how that person is thinking. Yeah. But that's its intent. If it's not a conflict, it's not a criticism. By its, very, by its inherent nature, criticism is always a conflict because it is conflicting with a behavior the person is engaging in or a thought that they're thinking, which therefore is the intent. But you know what? Uh, you do bring up a good point there because many people think that criticism must be absent from relationships. <laughs> and that is a relationship <laughs> recipe for disaster. If I have to go through 40, 50, 60 years of a relationship and I neither criticize you, and you neither criticize me, I think we're going to have a pretty miserable relationship. We may stop bathing. We may stop flushing the toilet. Uh, we may stop using deodorant. Uh, we may begin to uh, burp and pass gas in each other's presence uh, because, of course, we cannot criticize anything, and that means everything is a free-for-all. You see, there's actually a value in criticism. But we need to present it courteously, but then we also need to hear it accurately. See, that's Mm -hmm. two uh, important ingredients there. Present it as courteous as possible, Mm -hmm. but also the other half, the other ingredient there, is to receive it by hearing it accurately Mm -hmm. in a realistic way, in a healthy way. What is the, the healthiest way I can think about you telling me, Gosh, does something smell around here? Did you, when's the last time you bathed? <laughs> and you, if I know that you care about me, why would I not find value in that? Mm-hmm. I mean, why do we have yeah. to go through relationships, the entire relationship without uh, criticism? Right. And yeah. I think that that goes with the concept of listening to understand rather than to respond. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, because a lot of times if we hear something we don't like, Instead of just waiting it out and listening to the rest of what the person has to say, we'll jump on it and be like, well, wait a minute. No, but you do this, you know, 
or wait a minute, I don't do that, you know, instead of actually listening to the whole conversation. We just We're take offense out. and we think that any criticism is a threat to exactly. us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Criticism may be a threat to an unhealthy behavior. Mm-hmm. Criticism may be a threat to a particular type of thinking. Mm-hmm. But we need to differentiate ourselves from our behavior and differentiate ourselves from our thinking. If I'm thinking inaccurately, well, doesn't that deserve some, well, critique? Mm-hmm. Some mm-hmm. critical thinking. Let's move on to some social media pseudo psychological claptrap, such as body positivity, <laughs> fat mm-hmm. shaming, skinny shaming, slut shaming, social status shaming, and gender shaming. Uh, what are your thoughts on all the, the 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 shaming rigmarole going on in social media? There is a problem with that. What's the problem with saying that someone else? has the ability to reach through a computer screen and effect or manufacture shame in my brain. Did I just give it away? I think you may have just <laughs> given it, it away. away. Yeah. Yeah. Too much. Away. I can never <laughs> tell. <laughs> I think you just gave it away, but I'll, I'll take a stab in the, well, not in the dark, because, you know, it, you just gave it away. But A stab into <laughs> the camera. A stab into the camera. <laughs> <laughs> or a stab into yeah. your eardrums for all yeah. of you listening today. <laughs> No, but I mean, it's, it kind of all goes back to giving away your power and giving mm-hmm. away your control to other people. You know, I don't want to let other people have the ability to shame me for something or to, you know, um, be able to, this is a big one you hear, make me mad, make me sad, make me upset. They don't have that power unless I give it to them. And I don't want them to have that. You know, it's so much more empowering to me, at least. And that's, mm-hmm. that's a big term that you'll hear out there is empowerment. It's so much more empowering to me to be able to say, no matter what somebody says to me, I get to decide how I react to it. Um, it may be uncomfortable. I may not like it, but I still have the power to choose what I'm going to do with it. Mm-hmm. And why would you farm out your power to decide who you are to faceless keyboard cowards? You know, they're cowering behind a keyboard. You don't know them. Uh, you may not even like them if you knew them. You're certainly not going to hold hands and take long walks in the park. Mm-hmm. Why would you farm out your power to define who you are as a person to these people? That's a terribly bad idea. Right. Mm-hmm. Terribly sabotaging idea. Well, and two, you know, if we're kind of going off of that, what is the likelihood that we are going to be able to shut up every single person that we don't like what they have to say? There are how many? What is it? Seven something billion people? Almost now? eight billion. Almost over eight billion seven now? billion people yeah. on the wow. planet. Yeah. We have a thing called. Uh, uh, gas tape, government approved speech tape. Right. And we're thinking about uh, lobbying Congress and getting a law passed where <laughs> the police, your local soap police, this is the uh, special offense assessment police, S O A P, special <laughs> offense assessment police, will be passing out gas tape in your neighborhood. Anyone that says anything that you don't like, just wrap some gas tape around their freaking mouth. Shut them up. <laughs> what happens enough when you tell enough. yourself things you don't like? Uh-oh. Oh, you have to gas, mean, tape, you have to gas tape there. your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we would actually start there with your brain and say, <laughs> instead of shutting others up, uh, you might listen to what they say, see if there's value, uh, view it like eating chicken, pull out the, pull out the bones, eat the meat. Uh, but then also, instead of shutting them up, decide that what, if, if what they're saying has no value, then just let it go. I mean, yeah. does a screeching mm-hmm. car tire have value to you? Well, not unless it's about to run you over. Can you not ignore the sound of a screeching car tire? If you hear a tree fall in the woods, does that mean that's a threat to you? Oh, we've got to stop all the trees falling in the woods because when I hear that sound, it is a threat to me. No, not unless you're standing under it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Does the sound of a jet plane going through the sky, uh, is that a threat to you? Well, maybe you're you're frightened at sounds because you think that loud noises are indicate a threat to you. But are we going to outlaw the sounds of jets in the sky? I mean, how many sounds (laughs) do we have to make illegal before we're safe? And that's my problem with the uh, fat shaming, skinny shaming, slut shaming, social status shaming, is it's all just noise. 
Mm-hmm. Why would I decide that this noise, words, sound waves, riding on the air, leaving someone's lungs, mm-hmm. or pixels in a pattern, if typed in a, in a social media meme, pixels mm-hmm. in a pattern on a page are a threat to me. Right. The right. problem with that, the more things you label as a threat to you, the more things you will label as a threat to you. And your mm-hmm. radar, those listen can't see this, but I've got my fingers in the little donut pattern. Your radar goes from being the size of a donut to the size of a freaking football field. Everything becomes a threat to you, but only because you've decided that. Mm-hmm. And if you're thinking, and these are to the teenagers and the parents, parents, you can use some of this to educate your kids mm-hmm. on how to become, as I told my own kid who's now grown, to be the most powerful thinker in any room, even a chat room that you enter into, because you don't have to change the other person's behavior. You don't have to gas tape their fingers or gas tape their mouths. You get to decide what to think about what they're saying. Mm -hmm. They can say what they're saying the same way you can tolerate the sound of a tree falling in the woods, the sound of a lawnmower, I mean, goodness, what should we do? If we, if we think that the sound of a lawnmower is threatening to us, let's gas tape the lawnmower, gas tape the tree, well, gas tape the jet, thunder. gas tape the barking dog, <laughs> gas tape the sky because there's thunder yep. and we think it's a threat to us. <laughs> I mean, how much sound can you gas tape, government approved speech tape? How much sound can you make illegal until you decide that you're safe? That It is never ending. It is a never ending, bottomless, slippery slope. Mm-hmm. Better off. Uh, thinking about your thinking, we call that metacognition. Because eventually you'd have to just gas tape your brain and yourself and mm-hmm. everything. Well, you'd have to be put in a coma. Yeah. I mean, you, you, yeah, you actually you need to, I don't know, pour your brain full of antifreeze or gelatin or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, de- de-electrify your brain so that it can't even think thoughts. Because your radar has grown from the size of a donut to the size of a football field. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, that brings us to talking about the cancel culture. That's isn't that what uh, cancel culture is all about? If if you say something that someone else doesn't like, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. you should be disallowed from saying that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is really kind of ironic that people that talk about shaming are also, which I don't believe there's such a thing as shaming. Uh, if you looked at me and said, hey, Doc, man, you need to get rid of that little donut, speaking of donuts, around your belly button. I might look at it and pinch an inch and say, yep, man, I'm working on it. <laughs> I sure am. Man, I hate your hair, dude. Yeah, you know, I'm not a big fan either. I, I don't know what else to do with it. Um, I get to decide what to think about those things, but cancel culture is about trying to eliminate things, I guess, that people label as a threat to them. And I, my question is, why is this a threat to you? Well, and sometimes it's not even a threat to them. They view it as a threat to other people. So they try to cancel. Like, I've seen YouTubers talk about, you know, well, don't say this in my comments or, you know, I'll just ban you or don't say this in our Twitch chat because I'll ban you because, you know, you're offending other people. Mm-hmm. So they're canceling people on the assumption that other people are getting offended by what these people are saying. Now, does that mean that if if people get offended at the people involved in cancel culture, that the cancel culture should cancel itself? Right. <laughs> yeah. I think that would be a great there idea. We go. Oh, my <laughs> Mind explodes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait, and can you really can you really find something that doesn't offend somebody? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that possible? Is there really something out there that? absolutely doesn't offend the almost 8 billion people on this planet? Well, eventually we would walk around and say nothing. (laughs) Yeah. Because if you said flibber fidget, that would get canceled. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Would you like some more mashed potatoes? What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the silence would be offensive too, because why aren't you talking to me? You're ignoring me. Uh Mm -hmm. I think think (laughs) that uh, I just came up with a, and and I don't like labels uh, for people unless I think maybe it's going to wake them up. Mm -hmm. And if you're involved in cancel culture, here's your new label. Listen up. Uh, You can cancel me for this. I I view that as a compliment. (laughs) At least I got your attention. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Cancel culture bullies, CCBs, cancel culture bullies. The whole cancel culture 
is just a yet another way, another name for being a playground bully. Mm-hmm. You're not protecting anybody. You're just being a bully. If you want to help people, then empower people by assisting them in learning how to think in a healthier, more accurate, realistic way. If you want to help people, stop disempowering them by removing the hurdles. Stop disempowering them from trying to silence any difficulty they might engage in or confront. Rather, teach them how to think clearly about those things. And to that end, we're going to close out today's show by talking about two of our favorite things. One is locus of control, Mm -hmm. and the other would be uh, accurate, realistic thinking, and and that is tackling uh, automatic negative thoughts, negative automatic thoughts, same thing. We have different creatures for those. (laughs) And what do you think that uh, criticism in particular, and and even compliments, how does that fit in with the whole locus of control uh, philosophy that we talk about? Well, if you're letting them affect you, that's having an external locus of control because you're focusing on what other people are saying rather than having an internal locus of control, which is like an example of that would be you seeing through them and seeing, like you say, pick out what's important and throw out what's not, take pick the meat out and throw away the bones. If you have the external locus of control, it's just all the mayhem that's going around. It's like that little dog sitting in the fire that yeah. meme i love i love that meme because it's he's sitting there and he's like this is fine and every you know because he's he's not affected by the fire around him now if he was like freaking yeah. out he would be affected by the fire around him. that's the external yeah. locus of control well and you know the thing is uh, uh I, I would say that the thing about that meme is if something is really threatening to you then then you have internal locus of control then you're empowering yourself to respond in a healthy way mm-hmm, right. with external locus of control if you can imagine a remote control you're literally handing that remote control to people that you don't even like mm-hmm. yes. i mean if you get into the fat shaming somebody's fat shaming me see i don't think you can do that to me because i'm not going to hand you the remote control to my brain and give credibility and credence to something you're saying that oh since you've got uh you know, you you don't have a, a six pack. Uh, I do have a six pack. It's it's hidden under, you know, the body fat that I'm constantly trying to reduce. But what does body fat mean? It means I'm human. Uh, a certain level of body fat is healthy. Too low of a body fat is unhealthy. I can tell you that because I used to do bodybuilding competitions. It was the most unhealthy time in my life. A certain level of body fat is great. If you make fun of my hair or my shoes, I would say, ah, well, then you probably shouldn't wear my hair or you probably shouldn't buy my shoes. By the way, uh, I'm, I'm barefoot right now because in the art lab we have people take off their shoes because <laughs> I'm just kind of a clean freak that way. Uh, what about if you make fun of me being a clean freak? I would say, well, if it doesn't work for you, then you shouldn't come here because mm-hmm. I'll ask you to take your shoes off. I'm not going to give you the remote control to how I think about myself. And parents, t- please teach your kids this. Mm-hmm. Do not give your remote control to people that do not have your best health care and welfare at heart. Don't hand them your remote control. You get to decide who you are. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing is uh, a mind reading. It is a distorted way of thinking, thinking that you know the other person's intent. If someone is making fun of you and trying to put you down, Gosh, I don't. If they're doing that to me, I don't know their intent. Maybe they just think it's fun. Uh, maybe they think that they are more powerful if they can do that. Maybe they just want to see if they can get a rise or response out of me. Well, I'm not going to give that to them. I mean, if you want a res- response out of me, it's probably going to be laughter. I, I think that that's just adorable. <laughs> I mean, I've captured enough of your attention that you want to make fun of me. That's precious. <laughs> I've, I love that. You know. Uh, the worst thing that you can do to me is is ignore me because <laughs> I'm going to keep trying to get your attention. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a compliment for, for people to think enough of me to hurl insults at me. I mean, I've really had to have made an impression to deserve that insult or, or, or rude remark or whatever. 
And uh, these are all just ways of thinking about things. Let's close out today with some psych pro tips. What works for you guys? When people are complimenting you, let's start there. That may be the easiest for some, it's the hardest. When somebody gives you a compliment, what do you think for you is the healthiest response? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I say thank you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Uh, my dad would use would say, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. You can try to pick it apart. Oh, do they really mean it? Is it really sincere? Oh, they're probably just making fun of me by, by giving me the compliment. Uh, that's underthinking. That's ignoring important aspects of the situation. And just focus on, uh, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, what about criticism? What what? Pick one thing that works the best for you. Mm, I, I try to make it as constructive as possible. So if it's something that I can actually work on, it's like, okay, well, this is actually pretty helpful because I didn't even think of it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once I process it and take the bones out and take the meat, then I make a point to not dwell on it, not think about it anymore. Approaching it with curiosity. Ah, you stole the words out of my mouth. <laughs> yes, that is what I, that I said that earlier, and I do that. I approach it with curiosity, and I ask for more data. Because mm -hmm. often when people criticize me, they're not very specific, and I don't know what they're talking about. But I want to know what they're talking about, because if they have a point, mm -hmm. I'm going to value that. Right. If it's just criticism to be criticizing, which a lot of on social media, people just, it's just criticism to be critical. Mm -hmm. They're just cranks. They're just keyboard cowards. Mm -hmm. They're just hiding behind their keyboard. Mm -hmm. That has no value. I paid no attention to that other than to find humor in it. But if you have an, a, what I would call an honest critique, backed up by some data or for some evidence. I love that. I'll take that all day long. Um, just a few pro tips there. Thank you for joining us today. Teach your kids this. Play the episode for your teenagers. Sit with them. Have a discussion. The most powerful way to teach your teenager, your child, how to handle critique is to have an open discussion about how to manage critique. The more you talk, the healthier your kid will become. Catch us on the next Art Lab. Bye, guys. Bye. Hey, T-Ballers. Thanks so much for being with us today. If we brought value to your day, show us some love by leaving your positive feedback and inviting some friends to listen in and join the T-Ball team. Next time on Therapy Bites Art Lab. Too much of a good thing being a bad thing? Well, that applies equally to choices. Next time, we'll be talking about the psychology of choice and how more choices may actually be bad for you. Join us then.